Tonight's episode is brought to you by 80stees.com. And you can go to 80stees.com right now and find shirts uh, from your favorite cartoons. Favorite movies? Favorite horror movies? Favorite TV shows? And so much more. And on top of that, 30% off your purchase at the site. All you got to do is type in the promo code at checkout, slash tracks 30. Bravo. Bravissimo, 80stees.com. Amazing work. And thank you for sponsoring this episode. Check out the animated intro, and we'll be right back with you. Good evening and welcome to episode number 14 of Slash Tracks Action News. I'm Alex Vanover. And I'm Josh LaRue. Josh, before we even get into the meat and potatoes of tonight's episode, my very first question, what are you drinking tonight? I've actually got, it's not the uh, contest ones from January, this is actually from the shelves in Canada right now, Crystal Pepsi, Canadian version, Crystal there. What does that mean, Crystal Pepsi Clear? Is that what that says? We're going to have to ask our Canadian friends up north. <laughs> That's French Canadian, but yeah. Crystal so. Pepsi Crystal. Or does it just say Crystal on both? It just says Crystal Pepsi Crystal. Okay. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot better than what I had before because the ones I had before were from January. Like, they expired in May. So, like, I had it right on the verge of expiration, so it wasn't very, ca- like, very carbonated, but this one's, yeah. like, you know, brand new. So. Ready to go. Um, when I So I used to work at this restaurant, and there was this convenience store that, it was a really weird convenience store. They sold, like, old video games at the counter, and they, like, everything they had was, like, they'd have a weird train set in the back, and then they'd have, like, discounted candy in the front. And it was, like, candy that wasn't even from the same company. It was just weird <laughs> grab bag baskets of weird crap and just weird displays and all this stuff. Yeah. So one time I was in a pinch and I wanted to go get a Mountain Dew and a Pepsi before I went to bartend. So I go to this weird convenience store and I get my sodas and I go over to the to the bar and I take a sip of my Pepsi and it t- it made no fizz sound, made no hiss when I opened it. <laughs> I took a drink and it was just like I was drinking just dark flavorless water. It, so I look at the date on the labels, and they were, like, from a year prior. They had expired, like, a year before that. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. So it was all horrible. It ruined my whole night at work. Oh, uh, I've got the 90s covered there, man. Um, what do you got covered for the 80s? What you wearing? Oh, 80stees.com. Good question. Today's show sponsor. I've got a Masters of the Universe He-Man t-shirt. And let me tell you something, Josh. I'm glad you asked about this shirt because it's really comfortable, a uh, great design. And also, I say this every time I talk about 80s tees, but I really, whoever's running the press over there, kudos. Yeah, my biggest pet peeve when I buy a shirt is if you get the logo and it's sideways or it's like ha- like partially over to one shoulder more than the other. That is so annoying. I bought one from uh, Kohl's recently, a Jurassic Park shirt, and it said men's large or extra large, sorry. So I just took it. I'm used to, you know, I always get that. Got it home, and it was a women's, you know, and that was Kohl's. Uh, So the wife enjoyed that shirt, but, you know, you don't, you get such better quality and attention to detail from 80s tees. 
Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, they, they specialize in licensed shirts, and you're going to find something great there. And you can get 30% off of it, off your purchase, too, right? Yeah, you can, Josh. I'm glad you brought up that very important point uh, of this uh, little ad we got within the episode. If you use the code slash tracks 30, Josh, you can get 30% off your purchase at checkout. There you go. Yeah. Josh, um, we talked about something yesterday after I had written the rundown already, and you knew it was important. I knew it was important. I want to get into it. I couldn't fit it into the rundown because the rundown's pretty uh, pretty deep today because we haven't done an episode for about 10 days. So we're going to have a pretty very – we're going to have a really good episode today, but we got it's chock full of uh, you know information and stories and fun facts and everything. But the very first thing I want to get into is the Batman, uh, Batgirl movie news. Yeah, I can't believe HBO Max is going to just throw this movie out completely. They filmed the entire movie. Uh, I don't really care much about the whole Batgirl aspect. I like D- D- I'm like a DC fan person more than a Marvel fan person, but they haven't exactly nailed it cinematically. Mm-hmm. Like, they're trying too hard to copy Marvel, and I wish they would just do, like, standalone movies like Joker, because I think that's where they shine. They're not real good at keeping it all cohesive. Um, but Batgirl was going to be the first of multiple movies that had the return of Michael Keaton as Batman mm-hmm. from his 89 movies. That continuity, I said it right that time, and... Uh, continuity. <laughs> continuity. And uh, also, <laughs> Whores Divorce, uh, or Durs, when I was a kid, I thought it said Whores Divorce when I was reading mm-hmm. it. <laughs> um, but yeah, Brendan Fraser was going to... Uh, wasn't going to. He did play the villain in the movie Firefly. And, you know, they, they got the whole movie done, post-production, like, 80% done, and HBO Max is like, throw it out into the trash with Scoob 2, uh, which I'm not big on the new, on Scoob. I really, you know, I like the live-action ones and the old cartoon, but uh, I just can't believe they're going to ditch the possibility of any profit I honestly think what they're doing is trying to capitalize like they did uh, with the Justice League Snyder Cut. I think this is all about taking something they don't think a lot of people want to see, but by taking it away from them, it's going to make people want it to be released, and it's going to mm-hmm. like build up a big hashtag movement eventually, and they're going to sell a lot of subscriptions that month that they release it finally. That's what I think. I don't think it's going to be gone forever. Uh, I think it's a, it's a gambit to make some extra money. But I want to see um, Michael Keaton, man. Don't you? Uh, oh yeah, I do. I've I've even I looked on the inter the internet and I saw photos of him in the suit. Um, and I was teasing I was teasing with another supervillain, uh, not just Firefly. Actually, the spoiler was over uh, for dinner <laughs> last night, and he was showing some uh, screenshots of Batman in his suit on set of the Batgirl movie that got canceled uh, after they made it. Uh, but he was showing me the screenshots and. Uh, yeah, I was hyped. I really wanted to see Michael Keaton as Batman again. Um, and I made a joke to my brother. I was like, so, because it looks exactly pretty much like his suit did in 89 and also in Batman Returns. And I said, okay, well, it's been like 30 years. He's made no modifications to that <laughs> suit for 30 years. Like, he still can't move his neck, apparently. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, he made no modifications. He's, he's the opposite of Tony Stark in the DC Universe. Man, and well, actually, you know what? You, there's another chance to see him in the suit in the Flash movie. Oh, wait a second. That one might not be coming out either uh, yeah. because that production's riddled with problems of the guy playing the Flash. Yeah, uh, Ezra Miller is busy uh, grooming underage girls and driving around the United States of America with a loaded gun and a bulletproof vest on. Uh, we say that's allegedly on this show. We don't say if we don't know for sure. It's allegedly yeah. at this point. Well, according to TMZ, uh, which has, I don't know, TMZ, you kind of think of them as like a national inquirer type of thing, but they've broken a lot of major stories that turned out to be true. So, Oh, it's probably take, true. It's probably yeah, true. take it with a grain of salt. Ezra Miller, like, losing his mind right now. Um, he's kind of went unchecked for a while with this kind of behavior. So they should just have the guy who plays the Flash on the TV show yeah. take his part. Grant Gustin. Yeah, He's just good. have him take over. He's good. Right? He had to refilm the whole movie. They pretty much finished it, too. 
Well, they don't, obviously don't care about uh, budgets that they're dumping into <laughs> movies because they're. It was 140 million dollars to film the Batgirl movie. Um, I read that since they're merging, uh, HBO Max is merging with Discovery. That, and don't quote me. I'm not some financial guru or genius. I just read stories. So apparently, by them merging and them not releasing Batgirl and Scoob and some other projects, they've also got gotten rid of a bunch of other stuff. Um, they're going to be saving X amount of dollars when it comes tax time. So by them getting rid of Batgirl, even though they spent $140 million to make it, they're actually going to be saving like $40 million. So it's like a $180 million swing by not releasing it because of some Hollywood like back end like tax loophole. I'm serious. Well, they, they already spent the 140 so yeah. if they saved $40 million, mm-hmm. that they would have paid on it. No, it's going to be like they're going to be actually like probably saving like 180 million to if if you're saving 40 that means the 140 you spent is probably just you know even they're pro- it I'm serious they're actually making money by not releasing this supposedly I don't know it still feels it's like bizarre. it's they're trying to make it more appealing is what I think uh like a velvet rope situ- like a red rope situation like a uh, club what was that studio 54 back in the 80s and 70s like if me and you showed up to Studio 54 and we wanted to get into this really elite club, the guy at the gate would be like, oh, hell no. <laughs> oh, oh, hell no. You guys laugh at your own jokes. Your production like, value sucks. Like, your ponytail could get in? Your, your ponytail could get in, but you'd have to be your ponytail's plus one. <laughs> and hope to God the guy in charge of the, the rope didn't look at your face directly. Because we're not getting in, bud. We, we don't get... We don't get through that rope without being somebody's, you know, plus one. That ain't happening. It's, it, it's disappointing. There's pictures, like, I think the trailer for The Flash and stuff had, like, the Batmobile uh, in it, like, under a tarp or something. And you can tell it's the 89 Batmobile. Nice. Man, it just... <clears throat> I hope these movies eventually see the light of day because it's like the it's like the nostalgia gods are, like, Screwing us right now with my like, <laughs> yeah. The nostalgia gods, Dikembe Mutombo, the basketball player who like blocks you, and he's like, no, 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 not today, not today. That's what it feels like. We finally get our OG Batman back, and uh, they take and it away. From us. Take it away. You know what? You're down. I'm down. This whole Batgirl news sucks. Let's let's get into the first segment of the night, and let's talk about nice comment, mean comment. We need a nice comment right now to lift our spirits. Let's do it. All right. Nice comment of the week. This was fun and entertaining from start to finish. Three hearts, two exclamation points. Gok Tug ASD. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Gok Tug. Um, and we're going to do the compliment sandwich, so we're going straight into the mean comment. And this mean comment, this guy is a dick. I'm going to preface <laughs> it with this guy is a shithead. Uh, mean comment. How this has thousands of views, and he's referring to episode number 13 of the podcast, uh, the show we're doing right now, Slash Tracks Action News. How this has thousands of views, I cannot understand. F minus minus. What? His, na- his name is Hintzian and Muhammad. So Double it's two, minus? <laughs> it's, yeah, two names. Two names. So two names left that mean comment. So apparently two people were so offended by the success of our show that they had to team up like the Megazord to write one really mean comment. That's what the two minuses are for. Yeah, it denotes that two people are so offended by the success of our podcast that they just they had to team up and craft the ultimate shitty comment to leave us down in the YouTube, you know, comment section of episode thirteen. What an asshole! To forty nine percent, right? Yeah, what a jerk. Um. <laughs> And let's finish up this segment. Let's do the last nice comment. And Josh, I managed to do it. Uh, I didn't do it on purpose, but our main man, Michael Clark, left this (laughs) comment. Um, So, Michael Clark, fan of the show, friend of the show, your finally nice comment of the week. All right. So, this is referring to, I think, episode 13, when me and you started doing Hogan and Macho's voice. Oh, yeah. So he says, Alex, your Randy Savage voice is on point, and I busted out laughing when you'd say, yeah, the way that Macho would. I actually was a big fan of wrestling back in the day, on top of being a horror film uh, horror, horror film buff. But yeah, I really enjoyed the episode. Both of you guys are always entertaining and fun to watch. Michael Clark. Thank you, Michael Clark. 
Thanks, Michael. Michael. We're not worthy. Yeah, Michael, we're not worthy to even be your friend, man. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's get off Michael's dick for a moment, and let's get right in. <laughs> let's get right into the fun facts. I've got one small fun fact uh, for the beginning, and then oh. I'll, I'll let it go. Uh, Thirty-eight years ago, on August eighth, a legend was born into this world. You. The 80 slash for librarian. Yes. Uh, by the time this is uh, on the channel, uh, I think my birthday is going to be rolling around. It's going to be Monday. So, Monday, August 8th. Happy birthday to me. 38 years young, and your ponytail is going to be almost one year. Almost uh, one year. Yep. September. Yeah. September to be a year old. That's when I started growing it. Man, if you were still wrestling, that'd be one hell of a gimmick if you did a hair match now with those locks you have going now. You draw some heat, dude. You yeah. get some serious <laughs> serious interest. I wouldn't want to get get beat this time and get my head shaved. It's too much damn work. You know, back back in the day, it was just a normal haircut, and I lost to a guy with nice hair. Um, <laughs> what if the payday, though, was big enough? Would you do it then? Yeah, but, I mean, indie wrestling, a big payday could be like 75 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, we'll give you 75 bucks, and you can go to Applebee's tonight on us. But you have to get the two for 20. In a case of Crystal Pepsi. Yeah. Well, okay. well, if it was a case of Crystal Pepsi from Canada, which is where you got your Crystal Clear Pepsi from, this time, why don't you tell them how much you paid for those Crystal Clear Pepsis? 50 cents a piece. No. no Ten dollars a piece, four of them uh, from Canada. So, yeah. Yeah, Crystal, Crystal Pepsi Crystal from Canada is almost as much as just Crystal, the champagne, in America. Or the world. <laughs> yeah, per bottle. Yeah, um, Josh, first, first fun fact, other than your birthday coming up on Monday, by the way. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Ohio doesn't allow strippers to touch you unless you're, immediate fam- or unless you're an immediate family member. The Lannisters uh, run this uh, strip club, anybody wondering. Um, Cersei and Jamie from Game of Thrones. Uh, their ancestors started this strip club, apparently. <laughs> what the hell is up with this rule? Is that because, like, we don't want people touching the strippers? Or would I understand that? But, like, they had issues with family members who were upset that their family members were stripping so they could, like, physically remove them from the back room. I don't know how... What see the sign. I just want to see the sign. Yeah. what they? This was such an issue that they had to make a rule, a law about this. Like, I don't... But why... Where's it at one more time? Ohio. Oh, okay. And, I was thinking West Virginia. Yeah, no, or Mississippi. <laughs> no, um... The only claim... Yeah, I apologize to any slash holics in Mississippi. I meant no harm there. Uh, I'm in Oregon. So. You can, we yeah. get that joke all the time. So yeah, you can rip Oregon apart too. Um, just a really weird fun fact that's really interesting. I don't know why they would make that that rule like that. It's like <laughs> the word. I don't even. Yeah, I don't even really have anything to say about it because uh, if I say anything, it just comes out sounding really gross and like <laughs> whatever. Um, <It's> sexual. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, all right. Now, hey, does, that place, does that place, uh, serve, like, uh, party rooms for family reunions? I don't know, but that would put a whole spin on the family reunion <laughs> dynamic, definitely. <laughs> What's the next uh, <laughs> Second fun fact of the night. Consuming caffeine will actually caffeinate your semen. Okay. hmm Yeah, so if you're poor, uh-huh. if yeah. you're if you're broke or you're poor or you're getting older and you still want to have a baby with your significant other and you want your sperm to work a little bit better, maybe pop, maybe pop open a cafe or a crystal Pepsi crystal and those little guys will wake up and find the egg a little faster. And there's the sperm story of the show. <laughs> yeah. You think there's just one. <laughs> Bingo <wait. part>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you better buckle up, bud. Um, no, seriously though. It's like, uh, does that help with uh, the porn industry? Do our facials able, like, if they need to get a shot really quick, they're like, this guy ejaculates way too slowly. Get this man a couple Mountain Dews or a jolt in him right now. I need those <laughs> sperm flying out of his dick immediately. Come on. Well, they say the whole pineapple thing, you know? Like, I, it I guess if, if flavor can pass, caffeine can pass. 
I wonder if somebody could, like, fill a drug test from that, you know? Like, if the... You've tested positive for going to a luau. Uh, <laughs> you're under arrest. Um, asparagus. When you eat asparagus, your urine smells ridiculous. I wonder if um, if you eat asparagus, does it affect your semen uh, <laughs> flavor and texture? That'd be an interesting one to find out. What do you think? You find that out yourself. I'm good. I'm going to do some testing. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, because down in the comments from, like, episode three, people wanted to know if I was a power bottom, so we're just going to take this a whole step further. <laughs> um, yeah, back in the old days, Slashaholics of the show, someone asked us in the comments, we had like four comments, and one of them was asking which one of us was the power bottom, so <laughs> the shows came a long way, uh, and at the time, Josh is like, we shouldn't even respond to that guy, he's an asshole, and I said, no, no, any, any comment's a good comment, we just want to help the algorithm. <laughs> I'll respond to this guy. Um, Josh, did you know one fast food burger can contain meat from a hundred different cows? Actually, I did know that. Isn't that not, not a hundred of them, but yeah. Isn't that just disgusting? I mean, they all go into the yeah. grinder. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, said, I, I love meat too much that I could never, no matter how much I love animals, I could never become like a vegan or vegetarian. Mm-hmm. So I just have to, like, separate myself from that. You know, I can be against the industry, but I still like the food. I know. And hot I know. dogs are one of my favorite, and, you know, that that's a whole other can of nastiness, uh, what goes into a hot dog, so. Oh, yeah, the great <laughs> outdoors. Cows, still cows, I guess. I mean. You ever see the great outdoors with John Candy and Dan Aykroyd? <laughs> I think I've told you this joke before, but it's it's uh makes sense. He's like... John Candy wants to throw a barbecue, so he wants to get hot dogs. And then uh, Dan Aykroyd's rich in the movie, so he wants to have lobster and steak. Yeah. And then Dan Aykroyd's, you know what's in those hot dogs? You know, uh, just lips and assholes. And then John Candy's eating a hot dog. He's like, oh, I guess that means I'm an asshole because I like hot dogs. Oh, like, <laughs> I don't know. That, that movie is actually one of my favorite 80s uh, comedies. I love that movie. If it got a remake, I think that would be a perfect movie. To have The Rock and Kevin Hart do together. Which one is that? The Rock would be Chet. The Rock would have to be Chet. Because uh, Kevin Hart can play the uptight guy, you know. And The Rock's good at playing, like, the doofy uh, doofy guy. I can just, I just want to see The Rock, you know, running from the bear. Or, you know, Kevin Hart, would, either one of them would be funny as Chet, you know, when the bear comes and knocks the door down. But it would make more sense jumping up and down on The Rock. And then uh, little Kevin Hart there. You you ever see the Central Intelligence with The Rock and Kevin Hart, oh, yeah. where The Rock Rock was fat and he comes back as like a spy super agent? Yeah. The, the that scene in the movie that movie's pretty much forgettable, but there's one scene in that movie that like I still think is just great. Uh, bad guys show up and they're trying to like kill The Rock and Kevin Hart, and The Rock just picks Kevin Hart up and uses him. As a weapon. He's like, he picks Kevin Hart up and he's spinning him around and kicking the bad guys in the face with Kevin Hart's feet and like <laughs> punching people with Kevin Hart's arms. It's so great. It's, that is a great scene. If you guys haven't seen Central Intelligence, that's, that's a pretty good movie. Would um, you watch them together in a Great Outdoors remake? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite scenes, uh, we already referenced the, Lightning in the head six, 67 times or whatever we, on our past show. But I, my, one of my favorite scenes has always been when they go to the birthday party for the 102-year-old man. And yeah. And they, they yeah. died on the yeah. white party. Yeah, <laughs> he's dead. Give, give him a kiss, twins, you know. <laughs> uh, Josh, uh, did you know for people with math anxiety, math problems actually trigger, trigger a similar response as physical pain? I can believe it. Yeah. I wish I could do this algebra test, but I'm just <laughs> in so much agony. Oh, my head hurts. Oh, God, I can't do this calculus because I'm in pain. Ugh. I can believe it. I know school can be stressful. So Kids uh, looking at long division or his multiplication tables ow. and he's, yeah. <laughs> ow. Son I need to go to the nurse's office. Damn, I, feel like I, I stubbed my toe on that problem. Yeah, I pulled my hamstring when I was going over my times tables, man. I am jacked up. You've got a third degree strain of your neural pathways. Yeah, this, you're out of math exams for the next two weeks. 
Damn, man. Uh, no, I only felt pain from math tests when the teacher returned the math test to me, and I found out how bad I did. You know, that comment that guy left me, that wasn't the first F minus minus I've gotten in my life, by the way. So, yeah. Okay, me either. In that regard, in math, like... <laughs> yeah. No good at math. I was like, perfect grades and everything else, but math was always like, oh my god. I just didn't have the patience for it, you know? I wasn't no. interested. I wasn't interested in it either. Uh, I loved history. I loved science, English. I was so into those. They writing. kept me interested in civics, all that, you know. But mm -hmm. math was just boring as hell. I never w had any aspirations to like uh, launch a space shuttle or like be a neurosurgeon or anything or be a doctor. I just, I didn't. The only time I wanted to use math was when I was trying to figure out my paycheck at KFC or Sizzler or something. Like, my take-home home as opposed to my gross. That was very important to me. Like, I'm real good at, uh, like, if I'm wanting to do even change, doing quick, you know, if they tell me the amount I owe, I don't want to have any quarters or nickels or anything. So, like, I'm real qu I'm real good at, like, quickly getting to, okay, I, I'm spending this much, you know. The, mm -hmm. I'm good at fast addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. That's where math stops for me. You know, that's fun. That's good to know, but all the other stuff just hasn't come up in my life. And I've done some, I've done a lot of stuff, you know, and it's never come up. So the only, the only other math that, like, in kind of the same idea that you just said, like when I was a kid, like rolling fifty cents worth of pennies, like just to be able to count to fifty, that was like very important. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, once I knocked that out at like age six, <laughs> I was done with math as far as I was concerned. Like, game over. Like, let's move on to the writing and the history and the geography and all those other things. Um, Josh, did you know that many men who climb Mount Everest uh, get boners in the process due to the change in altitude and blood flow? Like, many men? Like, many me? Almost, no. Like, many, like, multiple, uh, lots of men. Man. I don't want to hear math. Not Yeah, I'm not going to give you an actual math number. I'm just saying, like, in general... Most men, when they climb Mount okay. Everest, uh, have a boner uh, at, at a certain point of their climb. Um, and I think that would make it a little harder to focus on climbing Mount Everest because, you know, boners can be distracting, Josh. I don't know. What about you? What's your experience with having distractions with boners in your lifetime, Josh? Uh, nothing like that, but you've ruined airplane rides for me. <laughs> Because now, when I'm on an airplane, I'm just going to think that every dude on the plane is pitching a tent. As a boner? Because uh, of the altitude. <laughs> and we're about ready to lift off. We're oh, approaching. we already have. <laughs> uh, we, it's, the pilot just blacked out. What do you mean? Did he drink beforehand? <laughs> no, we got a massive erection upon takeoff. Do we have we're a dog gonna, or yeah. a porn star? <laughs> we're all going to die. He needs to relieve his semen immediately. We need to go to a strip club in Ohio and have one of his family members give him the lap dance. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Bring it full and, circle. And there's a wraparound. There's a callback, folks. Uh, he, okay, last fun fact of the show. Now, this one caught my attention. Uh, in 1982, seven-year-old Drew Barrymore became the youngest person ever to host Saturday Night Live. Yeah. I mean, I so, knew uh, that. Yeah. yeah. I knew that fun fact, but I had forgotten about it. Um, this is even more, uh, this is even more uh, crazy. The, the fact that she, when she was seven, she was like going into nightclubs. Uh, she has a long history of like substance abuse as a young kid. So she was like in Hollywood clubs when she was like 10, nine, eight, like drinking and smoking and stuff. And yet she was still able to host Saturday Night Live. Uh, when I was seven, Josh, I was just trying to figure out how I could get an extra scoop of ice cream from my parents right? or trying to figure out how I could be taken to McDonald's, you know, from my parents on the drive home from wherever we were. I, I certainly wasn't remembering an entire show of Saturday Night Live and rehearsing it all week and then knocking it out of the park. Well, in um, fairness, she did have cue cards, you know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. I don't even think I could read at seven. I was in phonics class till I was like eight. I had an issue with reading until I was about eight years old. So, yeah. 
That's but you know what? She's seven years old hosting SNL, and she still did a better job than Steven Seagal did when oh, he yeah. hosted. Sorry, look, they, they won't even re re air his episodes. No, that uh, ending that ending thing he did where he just beat up a bunch of like <laughs> old people. It was it wasn't even cast members. It was stuntmen they had to bring in for that sketch. Um, for no reason, just so he could do it. It yeah, wasn't even funny. He he didn't want anybody uh, beating him up. He wanted to beat up Hans and Franz. You know, because they made fun of him before. It reminded me of somebody else that hosted SNL uh, that was very picky about what they did on the show. And this person actually beat Drew Barrymore because this person was a toddler. Who was Donald, it? His name was Donald, and it was 2016. And uh, he was very, just as picky as Steven Seagal. Uh, had to have all the sketches sent to him before approval. Pre-approved. Uh, um, yeah, wouldn't let wouldn't let them do anything that made him look weak or made fun of his hands being small. So yeah, uh, Steven Seagal and him and uh, Sinead O'Connor has, was banned off of SNL. Yeah, like, she it's like a whole list of people. Man, it's crazy. Sinead O'Connor, like, didn't she say something about the Pope and then yeah, like burnt, like burnt, ripped the picture up or something? Yeah, she like ripped the Pope's picture up and like burn it or something or I can't remember. I, she might not have burned it, but she did something. The Catholic Church basically canceled her that night, and then yeah. Lorne Lorne Michaels was like, you know, the producer, creator, whatever, everything of Saturday Night Live probably lost his mind when he saw that she did that. Yeah, because in rehearsal she did something different that was acceptable. You know. Yeah. 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 Boy, the '90s were a different time, man. The early '90s, late '80s, uh, or mid '80s, like weird crap would happen like that all the time. Uh, what a time to be alive, man! I try to watch some SNL from back in like the '80s, not the late '80s because it got pretty good then, but like the early to mid '80s, and it's just hard to watch sometimes. Yeah, it, like John Lovitz, Anthony Michael Hall, yeah, um, Anthony uh, Michael Hall on SNL, Julie, Julie, or Elaine from Seinfeld, Julia yeah. Lewis Dreyfus, yeah, um, just a bunch of people that you, wasn't Ben Stiller on Saturday, or he might he may have been in some I mean, he might not have been on it, but Anthony Michael Hall, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, people that weren't com like known to comedians. be comedians. Yeah, yeah, Expe um, especially not ensemble. Yeah, you know, improv superstars. Yeah. They had um they didn't have John Belushi cuz John the legend, you know, had passed away by that point. They had Jim Belushi. Jim Belushi. Yep. And Jim Belushi, I'm not knocking Jim Belushi. I like a lot of his movies he's made, but he is not an improv <laughs> comedian. He is a character actor um and has he carried some films? Yeah, he's been the leading man in some films in the 80s and stuff, but he is by no means an improv superstar. The guy who in his family that was the go-to guy for that was obviously John, so... Well, Jim did one thing amazingly good. It's funny we brought him up. He did an amazing Steven Seagal impersonation. <laughs> he was he was perfect for that. <laughs> uh, I really liked him in the movie Curly Sue. Uh, have you ever seen the movie Curly Sue? It was like okay. a... Yeah, it was like a John Hughes, one of, like Breakfast Club, Home Alone, all those... That guy. Um, Curly Sue was one of his bombs. And Jim Belushi was, like, one of the main guys in that movie. I just really liked that movie. He did a good oh, job. Oh, shit. I thought I had a guaranteed thing with, with John Hughes, and damn mm -hmm. it. And it was one of the John Hughes, like, rare shitters at the box yeah. office. Boy, if it was made by uh, HBO Max, they probably would have saw the dailies and, the like, the shooting and stuff and been like, no, nah, uh, Curly Sue... We're just going to do the write-off uh, road here. We're going to write off Curly Sue. Uh, Curly Sue, we're done with you. Yeah, see you later. Josh, we're done with fun facts for the night. Let's sprint. Let's sprint to the end zone and do sports. I've been I've been sitting here waiting and waiting for that. I'm sure you have. Um, hey, what do we got? First sports story of the night. 25 years ago, on August 1st, Josh, Air Bud was released in theaters. <laughs> What about all of its sequels? Were they all on August 1st? None of those movies <laughs> went to the theaters, Josh, except for the the original, the OG Air Bud. Okay? Air Bud went to the theaters? Yes. Wow. The greatest basketball playing dog that's ever lived or will ever live. And I saw a really weird fun fact also to piggyback on top of this fact. Um, 
Airbud, the dog who played Airbud, Buddy in that movie, I guess was like twelve or thirteen, and he died like very shortly after the movie was released. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. I was about to ruin everybody's joy by saying most of the animals in all your favorite animal movies are gone. Yeah, I don't think the dog who played Benji the Hunted in, in the 1985 classic is probably still uh, roaming the earth. Or la- every lassie that's probably ever existed is probably dead. Meanwhile, um, that little cat from Milo and Otis is still kicking. Yeah, and the Geico, the Geico Gecko, uh, he's like, how old is he now? Because he, he got real offended in the latest commercial for Geico when someone asked if he was 75. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah, <laughs> but he's alive. Uh, I don't know if I have confirmation on the Taco Bell Chihuahua. Um, he's probably dead because uh, that wasn't that like a thing in the early two thousands. Yeah, hear on Taco Bell. Too, didn't he? Yeah, he's dead. Uh, so R.I.P. I, I know it's not an animal, man, for your R.I.P. segment. But did you know Mr. Peanut died and came back as a baby? No, I didn't. There was a whole thing where like Mr. Peanut died. And then was, like, reincarnated as, like, a little baby peanut, Mr. Peanut. Um, it what? was a real thing. Rest in peace, Mr. Peanut. Uh, okay. planners, did, planners did a whole thing, hashtag thing with it and everything. Was he reborn with his monocle and his hat and his cane? Yes, he has, his, he has a little baby monocle. I guess it's going to grow with him. That's fantastic, man. <laughs> Some of my favorite parts of going to a baseball game are eating peanuts. So, yeah, they got to be reborn, man, so we can eat more. <laughs> Salt those suckers up, put them in a bag, crack those things open, suck the salt off the shell, live your best to, life. I used to love Planters Cheese Balls, and they quit making them, then they brought them back a couple years ago, and like after two years of being back, they changed the recipe or something. Yeah. They're like hard, they're like hard as a rock now, and they suck. <laughs> you like break your molar eating some Planters Cheese Balls. Um Josh, did you know, okay, so this isn't a fun fact or anything. This is the second sports story of the show. Um, So Bill Russell, have you ever heard of Bill Russell? Have you ever heard that name? Mm -hmm. Um, He's the only basketball player that has ever lived that has won 11 NBA championships. So he's the winningest team sports player in NBA history. So he had 11 championships. Um, He wasn't just a great basketball player. He also... uh, he fought for civil rights uh, back in the 60s. He fought for just rights of every man, woman, and child. This guy was a, a great person. He was a mentor to a lot of today's players, yesterday's players. Just a great human being. Uh, Mr. Bill Russell passed away at the age of 88. He was a Boston Celtics legend, so I just wanted to get it into the show. Uh, show some respect. Rest in peace, Bill. Yeah, he'll be missed. Um, last sports story of the show. Uh, number three. So this one's kind of a fun fact. This is actually okay. this is great. Fact. Yeah, this is great. In 1928, Olympic rower Bobby Pierce stopped mid-race to let a family of ducks pass him, giving his opponent a five-length lead. In the last thousand meters, Pierce pulled ahead by 30 seconds, and in doing so, won the gold and set a race record. So he stopped for the ducks... Still won the race. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, that's, yeah. That's, yeah, that's karma for you. Yeah, so, you, so you, I wasn't always bad. I could see you, like, processing that. You're like, so what? You're like, oh. So he's, st-, like, I could see <laughs> you, like, kind of not getting what I said. No, yeah, he's mid-race. He stops to let a family of ducks go by. He's probably, like, biting his fingernails or whatever. They pass. This idiot passes him, takes over the lead, and then he catches the bastard and then sets the record and gets the gold medal. That's next level, dude. That's grit. Wow. Yeah. That is. That's fantastic. And those ducks probably probably shared in his victory at the end, got a little bit of champagne, crystal, Pepsi, crystal at the end, all over their little duck heads. Uh, Josh, let's jump right in. Let's leave that uh, fun fact sports section that you didn't like at all in the dust. And no, get... it's not that. I'm just trying to jump in. All right, you're you're like I don't know anything about ducks, and I don't know like know anything about rowing. So, well, no, I was going to say something, but a, but a family of squirrels was crossing in front of my computer, and I was stopping to let them pass before you <clears> said <throat> something funny. Oh, you know what? That's awesome. Are you telling the truth? Yeah. 
Oh, okay, that's great. All right. Well, I'll never know because I'm not there while you're filming. So that's great. I'm just going to believe that you did that. Okay. Josh, okay. let's get into wrestling. Let's get into the wrestling segment of the night. Okay, let's do it. All right. The 1997 WWF SummerSlam pay-per-view was 25 years ago this week. So that's the that's the SummerSlam where Brett beat The Undertaker when Shawn Michaels was the guest referee. So Brett ducks the chair shot from Shawn Michaels, who's the referee, hits <laughs> Taker in the head. Brett pins Taker, wins his fifth WWF championship, his last one, which ultimately set up the Montreal Screwjob situation at the Survivor Series that year. But this SummerSlam is, so you think that's the biggest story of the night, but it wasn't. The biggest story of the night was when Owen Hart, Brett's brother, tried to tombstone uh, pile drive Stone Cold Steve Austin, and instead of going to his uh, going to his knees, right? There should be like a cushion of air. Yeah, it's top of his head and the the mats. Yeah. So <laughs> instead of going to his knees like everybody else does when they're doing a tombstone pile driver, Owen went straight to his ass and yeah. it, and essentially almost broke Stone Cold's neck. I think he bruised his spinal cord, compressed a bunch of his, uh, you know, what are they called? C4, C2, C whatever. Vertebrae, yeah. Yeah, compressed his vertebrae. Like, Stone Cold was jacked up. And it's all because Owen went to his ass instead of his knees. And Owen was a technician, right? Owen was one of the greatest technical wrestlers, high flyers of all time. I still don't understand why he went to his ass instead of his knees. I don't know why he did a tombstone. Stealing, stealing, especially Taker's finisher, one of, one of Taker's finishers, that's, no. he was like the uh, locker room captain, you know, I, that's weird, it's re- it's always been weird to me that he went for that move, maybe it was just because of the spot they did, where it looks like uh, they come off the ropes and Austin catches Owen, looks like he's going to give him a pile driver, but he flips over and he's mm-hmm. holding Austin, but even... That aside, the fact is they stole a finisher from Taker, and Taker would not have been cool with that. You know, they would have had to ask permission ahead of time, and I'm pretty sure Stone Cold would have been like, "Why the hell you want to give me a Tombstone pile driver for?" You know, none of none of it made sense to me. I, I I just like go back in my head, and it's like all these moves, all these things Owen did so crisp and so beautifully mm-hmm. in the ring, and. Everybody loved Owen because he was always pulling pranks on everybody. He was like, uh, he lit up every room he was in. And then he like severely injured Austin when Austin was on his ascent to become one of the biggest names in professional sports history. Uh, That could have ended Austin's career. And it was because of Owen doing something stupid. And as a matter of fact, um, I've heard interviews where Austin has said like, you know, I really liked Owen. I respected Owen. But after that night, I didn't think his jokes were quite as funny as they used to be. So I've heard that quote. Yeah. I, I don't I don't think Owen ever apologized to Steve. I, I don't think so. I think he might have eventually, if he'd given the chance. But it could have been him protecting his spot, too. You know, I don't know. It could have like, been personal. I, I have no idea. And then also, um, moving away from the Owen thing and going back to the Brett thing. Um, so when Brett got the title back for the fifth time... Um, it was like that whole Montreal Screwjob situation could have been completely averted had they just changed the game plan and let Taker retain the title because Brett would have never had the belt. Uh, they would have never had to screw him over. He could have went to WCW. That's you know that whole situation is oh. is Vince knew that Brett was going to WCW. He helped him negotiate that contract. I don't know if a lot of people know that. Whoa, whoa, you're you're saying that Brett screwed, or that Vince screwed Brett? I am saying that Vince screwed Brett. He knew that Brett was going to WCW, and he still put the title on him. So he created that whole issue himself. But Brett is supposed to be a professional, Mm -hmm. and he's not really the champion, okay? He's the champion because somebody put the belt on him. Oh, God, here we go. When he loses, he's not really losing. Okay. So this whole wanting to, you know, not lose in Canada, sure, it's his hometown. <clears throat> but when anybody's on their way out of WWF, in the history of WWF, even Hulk Hogan let Yokozuna take him out 
destroy him in the ring. And that's Hulk Hogan, man. And Hogan put that belt on Yokozuna on the way out the door. I love Bret Hart, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. He did get screwed as in the fact that they went an alternate path than he thought it was going to go. I'm still not fully convinced on that. I think that I agree <clears throat> with one of my favorite heel managers of all time that it's a big work. Uh, Mr. Tennis Racket, you know who I'm talking about. Not gonna get into the, I didn't want to get into the whole other discussion, but yeah. Uh, he thinks it's a work, the whole thing was. I just don't see why, if Brett is so above it all with everybody, you know, about being professional and Hogan was only looking out for himself, yada, yada, why was he so concerned about keeping a belt that he didn't really win, that he didn't was, really lose? It was because, it wasn't because of the belt, and it wasn't because of Canada. It was because Sean... They had a discussion. They'd had a bunch of heat and issues leading up to this. And Brett basically said, hey, I heard I'm dropping the belt to you. Mm-hmm. I just I just want you to know you can always trust me to be safe in the so ring. Said, you can't trust me. No, he said, I, I want you to know I'll always trust. You can trust me to keep you safe and uh, put you over. And then Sean said, I thank you for telling me that. I, I thank you very much, but I won't do the same thing for you. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah, and then Brett was like, okay, fuck you. Uh, now I have a serious issue, and I'm not going to drop the belt to you. But Brett also had creative control, reasonable creative control in his contract for the last 30 days. So mm-hmm. if he didn't say, like Brett said, I'm not dropping the title to the you know, Heartbreak Kid, he didn't have to because he had to, both parties had to mutual agree, and he didn't. So I don't understand why Brett didn't sue Vince. I don't because know how that. Because it's work. I mean, look how big it made, how big Brett's entrance into WCW could have been. But it wasn't. They didn't know what the hell they were doing with him. They made him a referee. Yeah, they, they messed it up. Him... I'm, I'm saying it could have been a work to, <clears throat> you know, get WWE over, get Brett over in WCW. <clears throat> but the thing is, I'm sorry, I can't, I keep having to clear my throat tonight, but you're right. Brett had created, <clears throat> Jesus Christ. You're, just, uh, you're had, so choked up by the fact that you think it's a work that you can't even control your emotions. I don't think it's a work. I'm saying I believe that is an actual possibility. I don't know for sure. I'm not going to say I really 100% believe this or that, but I do believe one thing. What? I used to not look at the details of it, but over the years, Brett has said a lot of things about a lot of people. You're right. Brett had creative control. Another wrestler that Brett has downed countless times. Goldberg. Goldberg. For breaking out creative control. Hogan. There you go. He Brett has got on, has put Hogan down and other wrestlers like Kevin Nash and stuff down for playing their creative control card. Brett did that more than just, more than he tried to do it that night. Like, almost every main event he ever did, he played his creative control card, win or lose. Just like these other people did. And he did it that night, and I don't know. He got It's like he got mad because he tried to play them, and they played him better. I think yeah. Brett, if you watch his documentary that was that was released, Wrestling with Shadows, about his last year in the WWF and the screw job and everything, it's like Brett has a scene where he's, like, lifting weights at his house. And he's like, you know, it's like the movie The Shawshank Redemption. Like, I've got the warden in my back pocket, and I'm yeah. the star, and... We've got all these really great things going, but if I go to WCW, it's kind of an unknown. But in Brett saying those things, it's kind of like he's letting everybody know that, like, how Brett kind of feels about Brett. Because I think Brett, I love Brett. Brett's one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. But if you ask or talk to anyone else that ever was in the business with him at the same time, they'll tell you that the Hitman was a mark, like a fan of the Hitman. Yeah. So, he, he, he yeah. I can see, I can see that. Yeah, he he bought into it way too much and yeah. chose time because uh, he's he, one of my biggest inspirations. I love anything he's done. I was so happy to see him win the United States title, like in 2013 or whatever. When he came, yeah, when he beat the Miz with yeah, help like from celebrate the that, you know. But I think that he let his ego and his pride put him in the situation he was in in Montreal. Um. To hear him tell it, he didn't think it was right for the hero to lose in his hometown. Yeah. Going out the door, he wanted to come in and just hand the belt over the next night. 
but he also, on the same breath, will bitch and complain about the two times Sean handed over the belt without having to lose it to somebody. He'll talk about how Sean didn't want to put somebody over, so when he saw his time was ending, he would find some reason to forfeit the belt. He did it twice. He did it with the IC and the world title, right? Mm-hmm. And But then Brett wants to do the same thing, and that's his excuse for Montreal, you know? He wanted to win that match and hand the belt over the next night. Well, he wanted to do it because it's like, well, Sean got away with it twice, so I'll yeah, do the same thing. You can't bitch about one person doing something and then say, I'm going to do it too. No, that makes, you hi- than that. that makes you a hypocrite. Um, there you go. Brett is a bit of a... 90s Brett is a bit of a hypocrite, uh, but... I think that chip is slowly coming off his shoulder. Um, I just I just think that I just think that he came from a wrestling family. Uh I'll end it on this. He came from a wrestling family. That's he's probably never had a real job other than wrestling. His entire life and who he is as a person to the core is wrapped around professional wrestling. I and I it. think yeah, and I just think that um that's who he is. And I think that he probably takes it way more seriously than most people who have had other day jobs or whose parents have had other career paths. Because his whole entire life was pro wrestling. Oh, I get it. I mean, I'm not saying, like, I get it because I, like, was all wrestling. But I know that drive, and I just Mm -hmm. had a small bit of it. I can only imagine living, breathing, eating, sleeping it. Yeah, your entire life. I didn't even know that I was going to take the stance I took tonight until I took it. But I haven't really talked about the Montreal thing with somebody else before, and I have all these thoughts about it. And I just started thinking about all the things Brett had said about, like, Hogan and other people, and I agree with him. Hogan, politics all the way, looking out for himself, but yes, Brett, too. Um, so let's move on. Let's, let's agree to disagree a little bit. Love uh, Please don't hate we me. Both, we both love Brett. We absolutely love Brett Hart. Let's agree to disagree. I don't think it was a work. Josh might think it's a work. Uh, maybe in a future episode, we'll actually talk specifically about the screw job. Well, I 100% believe it was unnecessary on both sides. That's they what could, I want to say. Yes, I agree with you 100%. They could have been professionals. Vince could have been a professional and not went behind his back. And that's a bad look when you've been Brett's boss, his basically entire adult professional life, and then you do something like that when you're pretending to be their friend. Can I say oh, one last buddy. thing? We're friends. Whoa. Can I say one last thing about the situation? And yes. I know we got to hurry. Um, Vince was worried that it would what Medusa did with the women's title would happen mm-hmm. with his belt. That's one of his excuses. But like you said, Brett respected the business. Vince knew he lived the business and loved the business. Vince had to know that Brett would not let the belt that Brett coveted so much yeah, he would end up in a trash can. No, because in a, and I'll say my last thing on this, mm-hmm. you're a hundred percent correct. Brett never would have done that because Brett, Brett valued and, and held that belt on a pedestal in his mind. That was the spot he wanted. Brett historically, if you ask all the other boys in the locker room, Brett wanted respect and titles more than Brett wanted money. Yeah. So there's no way he's dropping that in the garbage can because in a, if he did that, that'd be him Shitting on his own legacy. Exactly. He would not do that. Hitman in the chest. He wouldn't be doing that. All right, Josh. We're gonna jump right. We're gonna jump right into the second wrestling story of the show. I'll go to the second camera. Yeah. Hold on to hold on to your seats, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Slash Alex. We're gonna get through this. All right. We've had. I'm just gonna come right out and say it. We've been having some technical difficulties, and this is our third time trying to tell this story. So, (laughs) let's fucking do this story right now, Josh. WWE recently has been holding open tryouts to hopefully sign more talent. Now, last August, they had released a memo to the company and basically to anyone who was paying attention that they weren't going to be signing or allowing independent wrestlers to try out for their company. So they didn't want to go the independent wrestler route. And that was a Vince McMahon thing. Okay, so Vince didn't like NXT because Triple H was signing all these independent darlings whatever. So Vince, Bruce Pritchard, all those guys, they don't want to do independent wrestlers anymore. So they hold a tryout uh, uh, and they decide they're going to just only have legit athletes, like former football players, former Olympians, former whatever. So they hold the tryouts. 
It produced multiple, multiple concussions, <laughs> ankle sprains, back backs being hurt, uh, people breaking bones, like tons of crap happened. And Josh, tell the people why that happened. Why would how, why would that happen? Because these people don't love the sport. They don't understand the sport. You can't force the sport down somebody's throat. You know, you can't. You can, you know, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Meanwhile, the indie wrestlers are people that have always loved wrestling for the most part and that live for it, you know, and that their dream is to be in the WWE. So they're going to, they're going to aspire to higher, uh, you know, training and everything than these former sports stars and shit because there's a lot of ego there. And most indie wrestlers, man, if they get a chance to try out, they're going to give it their all, and they're not going to be little cocky motherfuckers. Well, you also have to have somebody in the ring leading the match. If yeah. you have if you have two guys in the ring that were like former football or basketball players, who the hell is calling the match? Who's making sure that the moves are being executed correctly without hurting the other guy? You got two. You got the blind leading the blind in there. Of course, it's going to lead to injuries. This is the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. I, I can't believe that they are. They going to stop taking you know people that get famous and other. They're supposed to, no. They're going to still try to do that, but supposedly independent wrestlers are going to be back in the equation. Good. Why did they ever take them? It's the dumbest. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Let's put two guys in a pro wrestling ring and have them try out and execute maneuvers that you could kill each other with, uh, and they have no idea what they're doing. You're giving <laughs> each other your body, and they don't know how to perform the moves correctly. This okay. is. Stupid. I'm going to pretend I know something about regular sports and say it would be like baseball or football, basketball, whatever, like not taking minor league players into the major leagues, you know? Yeah, you, you just sign somebody. It's like, man, that guy looks like he could be a good, a really good athlete. Let's just have him step into the box and try to hit a 102-mile-per-hour fastball. No, it would be like the NFL and uh, NBA and all that only taking indie wrestlers to become football players and uh, baseball players and basketball players. There you go. Dumbest. Only, only independent wrestlers are going to be taken into the NFL and stuff and be trained to, you know, play football and basketball and stuff. They're, they're idiots. They're idiots. And you know who else is an idiot? Uh, anyone who paid to see Ric Flair's last match, which is actually the last wrestling story of the show. So Ric Flair last weekend, uh, I believe it was July 31st, or so, yeah, July 31st, Ric Flair had his last professional wrestling match, his last match, yeah, allegedly. Nice. Um, they sold out the house. There was legends in attendance to watch it. Actually, Bret Hart was there. Undertaker was there. DDP was there. They were all in the front row watching Rick. Um Rick had the match. It was a tag team title, or not a tag team title match. Uh, what title are they wrestling for? I wonder which tag- belt did win. <laughs> it was a tag match, and it was Andrade, who's married to Charlotte, Rick's daughter, and Rick, versus Jay Lethal and Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Um, Rick Flair and Andrade went over. They won the match. Uh, Brett, <laughs> Brett, Brett Hart. Rick Flair got some color, of course. He was busted open. Ric Flair wore the big gold belt to the ring. Yes. Uh, yeah, he's not even the champion. He wore the belt probably from the 80s that he has at his house to the ring. Um, he wore a T-shirt. He wore like a blue T-shirt. Uh, this is the first time I've ever seen Ric Flair wrestle with a T-shirt on. It was like Jake the Snake when he came back in the 90s and he didn't have a physique anymore. The last the last Nitro ever, he wrestled Sting wearing a WCW T-shirt. He did. You're right. Good call. Uh, but other than that, this is the first time I ever saw Rick wear a shirt. Yeah, he didn't um, want to knock anybody out with the skin. <laughs> I get, yeah, with a errant, errant nipple flap or errant, you know, gut Brett, check or whatever. Brett's face compared to Mick Foley's DDPs and Undertaker's at the end of the match says it all. Like, they're, like, clapping, you know, Mick's crying, and Brett's, like, he's just staring at him like, you know, the hell are you doing, man? Okay, so yeah, so Brett's face, uh, his facial expressions uh, told a thousand, <laughs> said you know, said a thousand things in one look. Uh, Brett, that's, even in his resting Brett face, that's what it was. <laughs> I read, I've read Brett's uh, book that he wrote, 
And Brett comments on Jake the Snake Roberts when he came back not having a physique, you know, and having to wear the, the, the full outfit over his body. Brett said that he would never, ever come back to wrestle if he wasn't like 100% of who he was as the hitman. Yeah. And I and I think he probably still thinks that because even when Brett came back and won the US title against the Miz like you said earlier, he wasn't the hitman. He wasn't wearing the gear. He what he didn't have his original music. He was a totally it was like Bret Hart like older what it wasn't the same character. He wasn't the hitman. So um I had seen that Ric Flair up moving towards this match. He had a comment where he was drinking every day alcohol in preparation for the match because he said he wasn't he said he wasn't worth a damn if he wasn't you know drinking every day and training every day so he was like trying to relive the crockett days the old 80s wcw you know 80s but he's just reliving his 80s you know i, I guess reliving man. the 80s and his 80s <laughs> but he's he said he's not at his best if he's not drinking every day while he's training dude i don't know how he's still here and so many of the other ones left us so soon you know it's this guy genetics you know, Genetics, dude. Two two airplane crashes, man. Two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. I don't know. Hey, man. I didn't pay to see it. I, I, I'm not even going to watch the replay. Um, I think Ric Flair was is, is and was one of the greatest NWA world champions of all time. Uh, he had an amazing career. Great, I mean, probably one of the best gimmicks of all time, the Nature Boy. But it's time. He's 73. Um, it's time to put his toys away. It's time to be a grandfather, be a father. Find another passion. Do something else because you don't need to be in the ring, okay? It's done. That's my opinion. That's just if, my opinion. If you want to see Ric Flair's final match and it be what what would be best to remember as his final match, it's WrestleMania against HBK. Yeah, and it was a it was a full on match. Ric Flair could still do all the moves. Does a crossbody. Um, it's a believable storyline. Shawn Michaels grew up idolizing Rick, and he right before he gives him sweet chin music, you can see him, you know, apologizing and telling him that he loves him. Yeah, and then lays him out. And but Rick is still trying to fight. He's got his fists up. They told a great story. They did. Yeah. They did. Um, Josh, let's, let's finally, finally get out of the wrestling section after seven restarts and let's get into the horror and spooky news of the episode. Let's do it fast. All right. I'm kidding. Yeah. All right. August 1st. Uh, so last, you know, this week in 1986, so 36 years ago, Jason lives was released in theaters. Mr. Tom McLaughlin, who you've actually interviewed on the channel. It's here. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Writer, director of Jason lives. Uh, Jason Lives was released in the theaters in 1986. And the reason I bring this up as news is because that film basically reignited the franchise because part five what didn't have Jason. Everyone knows it had... Spoiler alert, it wasn't Jason. It was Roy, the paramedic <laughs> driver. <Jack> Smithers. <laughs> yeah, it was just some random guy as the killer with the blue chevrons on the mask as opposed to red. So Tom McLaughlin, uh, being a genius that he is, created zombie Jason. So the Jason that everybody knows and loves to this day, Tom McLaughlin is responsible for that Jason. So, yeah, thanks, Tom. And he even has written a sequel to Jason Lives. I know uh, that. Internet Part 7. That would yep. be cool. And uh, I, heard, I heard he wants to have CJ come back, yeah. not Kane. He wants to have CJ, who played Jason in Jason Lives. Yeah, CJ's, CJ's my second favorite. Uh, we've got an interview with him on the channel, too. Uh, yeah, check him out, man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, Jason, Jason lives is one of my favorites. Um, it's crazy that part five is actually in my top five Jason movies and Jason's not even in it. You know, I make the joke that it's old man burns, you know, and he would have got away with it if it wasn't for those damn psychiatric patients. Yeah. It's just so different. It's a, it's a breath of fresh air. It's different. It's got a lot of, it's got a lot of the best kills too from the series and, yeah, the whole Roy Burns thing sucks, but I mean, just seeing Jason or Roy, whatever, bursting that door into Splinters, which makes no sense when you find out it's Roy Burns. Yeah, um, how does he do that? He, yeah. What the hell? Dynamite, you know, he had some, like, black cats or something, like a pack of them, uh, t- like ten packs taped together, and then walks through. And also, uh, 
no one got lucky against him until the end of the movie. It's like he's a normal dude. Like yeah. somebody defending themselves is going to get lucky and kill his ass. He's a paramedic. I mean, how yeah. many paramedics have you seen that that are going to do a you know be like? I bet that guy can kill a bunch of people without anybody fighting back. You know, he's not even a, he's not even a fit paramedic. He's he's overweight and he's middle aged. He's not even fit. And also in that. He's upset it's, about a kid he never even sees. Yeah, so he's pissed off that his kid was murdered at this halfway house for, like, troubled teens. Yeah. Uh, the kid gets murdered when he's trying to give Vic a candy bar while he's chopping wood. Uh, <laughs> guy puts an axe through his kid's back. Um, if he's such a great, loving father, why is the kid at the halfway house in the first place? Why isn't Roy taking care of him? What the hell is going on here? I know. <laughs> I don't know. None of it makes sense. And did you, did you know that the, Friday the 13th Part 5, the director of that film was a porn director? Really? He wasn't even like an actual movie director. He was a porno. He did porno flicks. Well, he directed Deborah Voorhees pretty good in that one scene, so I should have seen that coming. Oh, yeah. Hottest, probably the hottest girl in the Friday the 13th franchise. Best boobs, for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, he did a great job. The biggest, I'd say in Jason Lives, um, my favorite, probably the prettiest girl. Uh, my favorite final girl in the in the franchise, uh, the sheriff's daughter. Yeah. yeah, I I really like that character. She's feisty. She's funny. She's all. Uh, what does she say to her dad? He's like, I, I'm gonna take care of Tommy or something. She's like, What are you gonna do, Dad? Take his temperature or something like that. She's, yeah. She's yeah. She's like she's great. Um, As a kid, I didn't understand the tension and the power of one scene with him until I became a dad myself. And that's when the sheriff uh, sees Jason going towards his daughter. Mm-hmm. And before that, the sheriff's hiding, you know. But once he sees that Jason's going in that direction, that's whenever he comes out of hiding. And, you know, he knows he's going to die. Uh, so there's a lot of power there, too. Like, I did not want to see him die. Usually you're not rooting for the cops or whatever, but... No, he was a hero by the end of that film. Like where he he basically saved all the children because his daughter was rustling the children off to safety, and then he confronts Jason, and actually was kicking his ass quite a bit. And then Jason eventually just folded him in half like a like a club sandwich there, uh, like an accordion. But he brought the Jason, fight to him. Jason lives also sets the precedent that I believe that Jason resonates with children. Like, he's kind of stuck in that stasis of being a child, kind of. Yeah, he doesn't kill any kids in that. Does that make any sense? Yeah, he, no, he doesn't, he doesn't attack any children, or he, he seriously just walks right through their bunk, doesn't touch any of them, does nothing. He, so like, he, the thing he does is walk up to Nancy and kind of look at her. Mm-hmm. It's more of like a inquisitical look, you know? Uh, are they, it's more like he's worried about their safety or something, or, you know, he's like, is that what I look like? I don't, I don't know, it just doesn't. Seemed like he's going to hurt her. He had every he, chance to kill every kid there. No, he was he's like a killing machine like the Terminator, and he was scanning Nancy uh, with his Friday the 13th Crystal Lake computer engine in his dead, deadite body, and he was scanning her to see if she was, in fact, you know, under 12. Because if she is, he's not going to murder her. Yeah, because a lot of people try to be like, no, that's, that's false, because in part four, he tries to grab Tommy out of the house. Okay, A... He tries to grab Tommy. He, he, like, straight up kills everybody else when he's that close. Yeah. And he, Tommy's, like, 13 fucking years old. A child is, like, a five, six, seven-year-old, you know, like, in part six. Yeah, like, he's... Tommy's pretty much a teenager. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Well, and then, you know, Jason in part four probably would have been doing us all a favor because there would have never been any Michael Jackson rip-off albums Corey Feldman would have been able to do later on because, you know, his ass would be dead. So... You know, Jason is for us to watch. Yeah, we should have been rooting for Jason, to be honest with you. Uh, probably no bad news bears nine when they go to Japan, you know, because he'd be dead because Jason got his ass. Uh, dream a little dream seven, uh, you know. And he, yeah, Jason would have did us all a favor. Uh, Josh, let's get into the second spooky story of the night. July 31st. Uh, so kind of this week, last week in 1992. The movie Death Becomes Her was released in theaters. That's another yep. one I cannot believe we don't have a remake for yet. It, you know, like oh. a like like a gender swap. Death Becomes Him. You know. Well, they could do that, but like that movie, um, we don't have to talk about it a lot. I just I really appreciate that movie. That movie was uh, Robert Zemeckis. 
who was also the Back to the Future genius who like helped make that film. Yeah. Um, that's a Robert Zemeckis movie. Death Becomes Her, Bruce Willis is amazing in that movie. Goldie Hawn's amazing. Meryl Streep's amazing. My favorite line in that film uh, is when the lady who's in charge of the serum that gives you eternal life. She's oh, talking, yeah. or whoever, they're talking to Bruce Willis' character. And it's like, don't you want to live forever? I mean, don't you just want to be immortal? And Bruce Willis is like, yeah, it sounds nice, but what if I get bored? What if I... <laughs> I just, when he says, what if I get bored? Um, that's his whole, his whole character's decision to fight against Meryl Streep, Goldie Hawn, and the whole, you know, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Elvis Presley, all the people that have taken the long life serum. You know, Bruce Willis just doesn't want to get bored. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't want to live forever and be bored. One of, the, one of the things I'll never forget about that movie from when I was a kid is I always, for some reason, remembered the ending when they uh, fall down the stairs. Yeah, and they break into like a thousand pieces. <laughs> and they're paint they're doing their makeup with like spray paint at that point. They're not even cuz they've been, you know, they've been shot, they've been stabbed, they've had their bones broke, you know, their necks broke. Yeah, if you guys if the slashaholics haven't seen Death Becomes Her, that movie is phenomenal. It's really Great good. Great special effects. Great yeah. special effects. Yeah, the best special effects scene probably is either the last scene you just brought up where they fall they like basically break into puzzle pieces. Or when Goldie Hawn doesn't she get a shotgun blast through her gut? Yeah, you can. Yeah, it was really good for this time where you could. See yeah, you could it. see through it. Yeah, you could see through it. So yeah, that movie was ahead of its time and still holds up. And the chick's neck is broken, twisted. That looked pretty gruesome too. Yeah, Meryl Streep's neck, yeah. and she doesn't even realize she's dead. She's like, "What?" The? She's like looking at her own ass. <laughs> yeah. Um. Let's get into uh, the third spooky story of the night. Okay. All right, so this is a big one for me, and I, I've already watched it like five times. Uh, Pennywise, the story of it, is a documentary on the miniseries that was released in 1990. So the original It miniseries, not the new movies, the miniseries that I grew up with, that Josh grew up with. This documentary had been in production for, for years. It was supposed to be released like pre-COVID, and for some reason it got shelved. It finally got released on Screenbox. So the same cha- the same little app that has Freddy's Nightmares has released uh, Pennywise, the story of it. And it has interviews with Tim Curry, has interviews with all the kids who were in the film, obviously not Jonathan Brandis, you know, R.I.P. Um, but it, Tim Cur- you know, Tim Reed, uh, who played an older Mike Hanlon, uh, John Boy himself. Uh, from the Waltons, who starred as the older Bill Denbro. Everybody, interviews everybody. Goes behind the scenes in Vancouver, where they filmed, uh, how the movie was written, how the spider scene that fell flat. <laughs> Ev- the director, the writer, Tommy Lee Wallace, who did the Tommy Knockers, also did this miniseries. So, <laughs> it goes in depth. It's really good. I recommend it 100% to watch it. I will check it out. Oh, so, please, uh, man. Yeah. Uh, and if you need uh, my code to get into my my screen box, just ask me for it and you can use it. Don't ever ask me to get into your screen box again. <laughs> if you need to get into my screen box, buddy, <laughs> you can have my code anytime. Uh, let's get into the last spooky story of the night. There we go. All right. This is also about it. The Simpsons have announced. So the Simpsons cartoon, you know, it's in season, you know, 79 right now. <laughs> the Simpsons will have two different Treehouse of horror episodes in season 34. So the upcoming season, uh, they're going to have two full Treehouse of Horror episodes, and one of them is an entire episode that's going to be dedicated to Stephen King's It. Oh, cool. Yeah, so they're going to have a Simpsons version of It. Oh, yeah. That'll be neat. That'll be I really want to... Yeah, I want to see that. That'll be really cool. That's one thing I can say. I've not seen every season of The Simpsons. I kind of quit around, like, mid to late 90s, but I've seen every Treehouse of Horror um, that's something I check out every year. So. They're still, yeah, they're still really good. They hold up well, but the, my, the one thing that I miss about the Treehouse of Horror episodes is they used to always start in the Treehouse where they're telling the stories. Yeah. They always began and ended as, like wraparounds, basically in the Treehouse. They don't do the Treehouse wraparounds anymore. They just go straight into the stories now. And I don't know if that's to save money or time or what, but they don't do that anymore. I'd like to see them bring that back in season eighty three. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, before, before they, you know, right around the time that Ric Flair has his last, last match. Um, <laughs> Ric Flair? 
Look, Ric Flair, the Nature Boy, uh, is having his last, 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 we're serious, really last match at age 93. Come on down to the Sportatorium. It's a um, handicap match. No, seriously, he's in a wheelchair. Yeah, it's a handicap. It's a handicap match. It's Ric Flair versus Death, the Grim Reaper himself, and Rick is trying to still go over. Um, let's get into some headlines, Josh. Uh, let's do it. All right, the sole winner. Of the $1.28 billion Mega Millions uh, lottery. Me? No, it, the winner was in oh. Illinois, and it Shit. was a solo solo winner, Josh. Yeah. The big news, though, $1.28 billion. This guy's uh, a billionaire, right? You think he's oh. a billionaire? No. $623 million, right? Am I close? Even worse. Oh. After taxes, he took the one-time payout, $433.7 million. That's more than he'll ever be able to spend in an entire lifetime. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Yes, I agree with you, but the the state of Illinois or the nation or whatever gets the rest of the money. Mm-hmm. They won double. So they, I mean, it, the it's government. Never, you never get what you, you know, what, it, I guess you can look at it, the higher it gets, the, the better you're going to get on the payout end. Yeah. You know, you're never going to get what it's actually, you know, anywhere that's close a, to what it's actually calling for. That's a third, though. I, I always thought it was half. That's a third, dude. That's not even... They could have taken, like, a thing where they get, like, a, what is it, like, yearly payments or something for... Yeah, people? but and, I yeah. had... I know what you're talking about. I'd read something that if you do that, you risk not getting completely paid out because you could die. Uh, I don't know that the payments roll over to family members. I don't know how that works. So... And it's probably easier just to, like, okay, take the tax out. I'm taking the money right now. I'm not dealing with this crap anymore. Right? Yeah. Like a Band-Aid, kind of rip it off. Yeah, just get it, because it's more money than you're going to be able to spend. Yeah, I don't know, man. You're. I think you're right. Um, I probably would take the one-time payout, too. And you'd never hear from me ever again. I'd never put my two-week notice in at the restaurant. I'm dead. As far as, you, as, <laughs> far as anyone that knew me before, besides Nicole and probably you and my brother and dad and a couple other fa- you know, friends and family, I'm dead. I'm going to be on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. You're yeah. not going to know I won it. Slash Track Studios. That's what I would do if we won. Build an actual studio, yeah. An actual studio for everything. You mean to tell me that you're not actually in a newsroom right now? No. No, it's just a virtual background. Wow. So, yeah, oh. check this out. You just, dude, Ooh. you just ruined the illusion for all the slash all. Or... I'd be like, I thought it was real studios. Um, yeah. Josh. All right, so we're getting into the second uh, headline of the show here, second headline of the night, and this is a tragedy, Josh. Okay. Klondike just announced the Choco Taco is going to be discontinued. I thought it was already gone. Well, it is gone. Uh, No more Choco Taco. It's gone as of, like, last week. It's done. Well, by the time I would always get one, it would be, like, in there too long, so the waffle cone part would just be, like, chewy. And, and like, yeah, like and, tear it. Uh, yeah, not crunchy anymore because the ice cream is no. ruining the the integrity of the waffle cone around it. Wa- it uh, I don't know if this is a serious situation. Like, are they just? Is it like a crystal clear Pepsi situation or like a uh, Batgirl situation? Or are they just like we're taking away the Choco Taco, so now you're going to really want the Choco Taco? Twinkies were gone forever at one point. You know, so they're back. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Uh, it probably, probably. I think it's gone away before and come back because I thought it was gone again. I mean, I thought it was gone. Uh, like I, I remember like Taco Bell getting rid of them, bringing them back. Well, so the, the only time I ever had a Choco Taco was at Taco Time. I never ever had a Choco. Like if I'm going to a like a Seven Eleven or pri- or like whatever a corner market, yeah. and I'm getting ice cream. Choco Taco's eighth on my list of items to get in that, you know, cooler. So, yeah, so I don't know. Pump pop is at the top of mine. Oh, I'm going for some sort of ice cream sandwich. I'm going for some sort of fudge sickle. More, king, get, <laughs> king, king cones are big, but king cones also have the Choco Sorry. Taco situation sometimes. And then sometimes you'll bite into a king cone, and all the shit on top of it will just fall over the side. <laughs> I, with the nuts and stuff, it's <laughs> horrible. I had a dude. I had a workout sheet um, for my Instagram. I took a photo of my daily workout. This is a true story. I ate a king cone, and the king cone toppled on itself. All the shit on top of it fell on the workout sheet. So the picture <laughs> I posted 
was like, I worked out today, I grinded my ass off, and it's just covered in fucking chocolate and peanuts and caramel. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I was like, so here I am trying to say I'm some badass, you know, I'm Kobe Bryant, you know, but it's covered in fucking chocolate. You know what I hate about ice creams, man? Like at the at a restaurant, or not a restaurant, at a, like a gas station or something, I'll get one of my favorites, like I, like I said, it's the cho- double chocolate banana bomb pop. Uh and I saw them at Walmart in the grocery section, so I bought a box of them. Oh yeah! And you get this thing in the gas in the gas station. It's like ten foot long. You Gigantic. Know? I got it at Walmart. It came with like eight of them, I think, and they're like that. <laughs> yeah, they're they're like the minis. They're like yeah, mi- yeah. fun size bomb pop. I mean, fun size for fun size. They were they were minuscule. I was like, oh my yeah. god. <laughs> yeah, you got screwed over. They do the same thing with um, like basically. <laughs> There's ice cream sandwiches at the gas station that are, like, that big. And then you get the box at Walmart or Target, and then they're, like, that big. <laughs> yes, yes. They're, like, yes. bite size. You can pop them in your mouth at that point. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, all right, Josh. Recently, at auction on eBay, a VHS copy of The Goonies recently sold for $10,054.17. No, it didn't come with anything. It's the movie. It's like a first run, first print, sealed copy of the Goonies. Jesus. VHS is the next vinyl, man. I see it coming. I think I it think is right gonna... now. I th- Dude, Josh, I think it already is, man. I think VHS is is back, and we talk about it every once in a while on this show. Uh, we're both big VHS guys, and these prices are ridiculous. So if you guys, the Slashaholics, we've said it before, if you go to a garage sale, you can thank us later, and you see anything sealed, buy that shit, buy the VHS copy that's sealed. You might be retiring just like the Mega Millions guy earlier in this segment. Seriously, ten thousand dollars? Not not a third. So yeah, you're yeah. getting it all. You're getting it all. You might pay the eBay fees. Which, by the way, Josh, have you sold anything on eBay lately? Uh, not lately, but they have changed things. Well, like mm-hmm. about six months, seven months ago, they they don't even do PayPal anymore, man. They take a big chunk of your your money. They don't do they, PayPal anymore. No, uh, like it, everything is through eBay. eBay. Okay. When you post it, they take out a little bit. When you sell it, they take out their their fees. It's 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 almost not worth doing it. No, dude. So, like and- a twenty dollar item, you're gonna get like thirteen, fourteen bucks. And also, you get taxed now. They didn't. They used to not do taxes, but now you get taxed. You get taxed on top of it. Yeah. Of oh man, that sucks, dude. Um, you know, starting next episode, we should like bring out a VHS movie. Uh, I just got through watching one the other night. Do you remember Space Invaders? Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> die Earth scum. Die Earth scum. Is uh, I busted that one out on VHS the other night. But that was fun. What, like, review a VHS movie? Or just bring one out and talk about it, man, like an old forgotten VHS tape, you know? You said Space, you had some. I've got some. Spaced Invaders came out when I was in first grade. It's like 1989, right? 89, Something 90? Like early 90s, yeah. Like, I'm, all I remember is the Satan guy handing out cartons of cigarettes <laughs> uh, for, to the trick-or-treaters. Like, I remember, like, when I was a kid, that's all I remembered, and I found the videotape of it. I've had it uh, put up for a while. I got a VCR recently. So yeah, I busted out and watched it. Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. It's bad. They're doing like bad Jack Nicholson voices and shit. It's kind of annoying, but it was good uh, throwback nostalgia. Good cheese. Well, I remember. Okay, so what I remember from that movie was the Die Earth scum, but I also remember they were like from outer space. They're showing up to like destroy Earth, but they get it's on Halloween night, of course. So the mom is taking her kids trick or treating, and she mistakes the Martians for kids in costume. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So, man, I better check out Space Invaders after the show. See what what streaming app is it on? Any streaming apps other I than checked? But I bet it's like one of those movies you could probably watch on YouTube. Oh yeah, I was just I was just gonna say YouTube. I guarantee it with ads. And if you watch anything on YouTube with ads, it's like every seventeen <laughs> seconds. You'll yeah, enjoy the, ad. the movie, though. <laughs> Jesus. Um, it's best to see it on VHS, though. That's okay. The, yeah. You get the whole 1989 experience all over again. Uh, so uh, here's another sport. Here's another, not sports story. Here's another headline. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. So this, I saw this from uh, Joe Rogan actually posted this story. 
Oh, so he read a headline: "Astronauts should not masturbate in zero gravity," according to NASA. Astro- uh, according to NASA, astronauts have been warned against masturbating in space over fear that female astronauts could get impregnated by stray bodily fluids. Didn't we talk about something about masturbating? We, t- in we space talked. Station? We talked about it. Like what? What do they do? How do the bathroom situation? And then it devolved, of course, into oh, masturbating. Okay. But this is a legit story posted online. Like that's a real headline: astronauts should not masturbate in zero gravity. Uh, Joe Rogan posted the story. That's how I saw it. And the, NASA's legit worried that if someone's jerking off in space, the the semen is going to impregnate one of the female astronauts on board. Well, if that doesn't convince you that NASA's a bunch of nerds that never get laid, that don't know how it all works, then yeah, uh, like there you go. That should convince. No, I'm kidding. Uh, well, is it going to go? Is it going to go through the spacesuit? Space like, well, how right. does this work? Maybe when you get to space, like protocol is to get naked, you know, or that's what their protocol is, so they can see all the female astronauts naked and say they saw a naked girl. So yeah, pro- well, maybe. And then also, I have one question before we move into the last story of the night. How? How does gravity work with the semen? If it, say it did, like does because it, it's it's got to reach the egg. So even if it got into said female, how's it reaching the egg? Because doesn't gravity go? There is no gravity. Oh, I know what that happened. Worked. I know what happened. What? A couple astronauts that were both married to other people went up to space together. Yeah. They got lonely. They had sex. Uh-huh. They came back. They acted like nothing happened, but the female who was pregnant. And she said, I don't know what happened. I guess my partner must have been masturbating in, in space. In, in space. And it went and it got me pregnant. So now NASA, you know, they she stuck to her story so much that NASA had to make a protocol. That's that's what I I'm guessing that's what happened. What did you ever see the story about the gal who like fell in love she was a NASA lady and she like fell in love with another NASA employee and like she like went cross country like in a diaper to go kill her co-worker at NASA's wife. Did you ever hear this story? No. It was nationwide news. This lady fell in love with her co-worker. They're both astronauts. Her big plan is she's going to drive across the country, kill the wife, yeah. but she's not She's not going to stop for bathroom breaks. She's, she's, so she wore a diaper all the way over to kill this lady. Uh, she wasn't successful, but she ended up getting caught. But they, like, caught her, like... You know, the big Scooby-Doo moment wasn't taking off a mask. It was taking off her freaking, you know, adult diaper. Well, okay. Just yeah. if, she, if she stopped to use the bathroom, she wouldn't get there in time? Is that She was, like, trying to, like, st- like hey, I didn't drive across country. I, there's no way I could have gotten over there that fast. Because she's wearing a diaper, so she's, yeah. So she, right. Did she have gas cans in the trunk? Like, what the hell? Is... Yeah, there's some flaws in this plan. So she's just shitting and pissing herself the entire way over here. She's gonna have diaper rash. She's a she is a NASA astronaut. She's a genius. They don't just let idiots be astronauts, and that's her big murder scheme. She's gonna wear a diaper, and that's gonna fix everything. <laughs> what the hell? I'll have to look that one up. Wow. Yeah, it's a true story. Um, let's get into the last last story of the show, man. Okay, let's do it. All right, dude. So. <laughs> Recently, um, TikToker Poppy, so there's a TikToker named Poppy, shared a story uh, that she was charged twice when she, uh, so this lady uh, sees TikToker Poppy uh, posting a story about people being body shamed, okay? So the headline is, woman charged double for eating too much at all you can eat buffet. So she jumps in on this thread that TikToker Poppy started, and she said, that she was actually charged twice when uh, when she got her bill at a buffet. And then she asked the restaurant workers, uh, this is a mistake, how come you're charging me twice? And the workers were like, oh, well, you know, we were watching and you ate way too much. So they tried to charge her twice, even though it was an all-you-can-eat buffet, Josh. And she put up a big stink, and of course, the restaurant got in trouble. She didn't have to pay for two, obviously, because this is bullshit. But... This is just like the Homer Simpson thing on The Simpsons when he ate all the the shrimp and the fish at the all you can eat you know seafood restaurant and yeah, the captain Simpsons, tried to sue him. Simpsons predicted the future again. Yeah. Huh? Stay for the freak. Or wait, come for the freak, stay for the food. Arr. I will tell you this, uh, 
talked to people in other countries, and I have, and I've asked this question, and a lot of other countries do not have all-you-can-eat anything. That's like mostly 90% an American thing. Uh, All-you-can-eat restaurants, buffets, it's an American thing. Other countries don't really do that. I can't... I, like, I like buffets. I do. I like going to buffets and stuff. It's, it's fun to be able to eat just a little bit of some steak, have some fried chicken, have some like whatever. Plate. That's all I can eat. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say that. It's like a gimmick. It's like a, it's like a gimmick. It's like you can eat everything you want, but you're going to have one plate, and then you're going to have some ice cream, and you're going to be done because you're drinking soda and probably eating biscuits with it, so it's like filling your stomach up. You're having mashed potatoes, rice, whatever. You're probably going to have a plate. If you go back, you might have a little bit more meat or something. But ultimately, the price of the buffet is going to be like twenty five ninety nine. They're making money off this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they afford the people that eat yeah. 10 plates. You know? so the, this restaurant that's trying to charge this poor woman twice for eating a lot, um, they must have been really hard up for money. Uh, this must have been like a serious, like they must have been close to closing if they're trying to get one over on this poor gal. I've noticed the jerks have been coming out of the woodwork lately. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot more of those videos on, like, Twitter or uh, YouTube and stuff, you know. Karens and Kevins and the like. <laughs> I, I, had, I had one at uh, Walmart the other day. A guy just yelling and screaming at the pharmacist because they've been they, their, their prescription had been called in two hours before that. Mm-hmm. And me and my wife were like, damn, our prescription was called in yesterday, and we were told to come, you know, the next day. You know, and this guy's, like, mad because it's taken two hours and they haven't got to him yet. And he's, like, screaming and cussing this lady out, and there's nothing she can do. Uh, and it just sounds like these people that charge this woman twice are just assholes. That's what the, it sounds like to me. The, the guy at the pharmacy you're telling the story about? Don't you know who I think that I am? Exactly. Like, do you have any idea who I am to myself? Okay. It's It was Bret Hart, and... Um, yeah, he was. <laughs> they had agreed that he was going to go over his prescription uh, in the match that he was going to have with whatever ailment he had. And then Vince is like, "I don't think so, you son of a bitch!" Like, oh, God damn it. The funny, the funniest part of the story is the last part of the exchange. I got most of it recorded. I might put it up on YouTube sometime or send it to one of these channels. But the last part of it <clears throat> about killed me. He goes, "I'll just go talk to a manager." And she goes, okay, you go talk to a manager. And he's already walking off, and he hears her say that. And she doesn't even say it mean or anything. She's like, okay, you can go talk to a manager. And he's like, I will, like as loud as he can. <laughs> God, and the manager's back there monitoring the situation. He's like, God, can't wait for that phone call or that email. That's going to really make my day that much better. Uh, last word. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Josh, I'm going to let you have the last word again. In the show, pal. Okay, thank you all so much for watching. This has been a hell of a production tonight. Um, be sure to visit 80stees.com. Uh, they got some great t-shirts there. Uh, not just from the 80s either. Yeah, check out the Masters of the Universe He-Man right there. Uh, all kinds of great stuff. Horror movies, movies, uh, TV shows, cartoons, video games, uh, mm-hmm. sports. Back to the Future shirts right now, like as we're recording, are 50% off. Yep. But if you check every day, they're having sales like that. Uh, they're always having like 50% off sales. And I'm pretty sure you can also use our promo code slash tracks 30 to get 30% off. That'd be amazing. Yeah. So with that being said, thank you all so much. Be excellent to each other. Good night. Have a pleasant tomorrow. Say good night, Alex. Good night, Alex. Mahalo, dog. Mahalo, dog.